She's been a singing star since the 60s, a civil rights activist, and a woman you don't mess with on or off stage. She's worked with Martin Luther King and sung everywhere that's anywhere. And once she even shot at someone who threatened to cheat her in a business deal. Still a huge star and as powerful as ever, she's our guest today on Hard Talk. You ready? I love you, Porgy. Don't let him take me. Don't let them handle me and drive me mad. You can keep me. Two days after forever With you forever Cause I've got Nina Simone, Dr. Simone, a very warm welcome to the program. Thank you, Tim Sebastian. You have the same name as Bach, my first love. Ah, that's, I can't lose with that, can I? No, you can't. <laughs> you can't, but I can. Tell me about music as a political weapon, which you've used it as. Oh, a now, that's a hard one. Um, as a political weapon. It has helped me for uh, 30 years defend the rights of American blacks and third world um, people all over the world to defend them with protest songs. And it helps to change the world. When you get up on the stage and you sing, what's in your mind? Just the singing? To no, to move the audience, to make them uh, conscious of what has been done to my people around the world. So you sing from anger? No, I sing from uh, uh, intelligence. I sing from letting them know that I know who they are and what they have done to my people around the world. That's not anger. It, anger. Anger has its place. Anger has fire, and fire moves things. But uh, I sing from intelligence. I don't want them to think that I don't know who they are, darling. <laughs> who are they? They are the white people around the world, with the exception of Nelson Mandela, whom I met this year. I went to his marriage and his anniversary in 1998. And you weren't disappointed? Oh, no, my God. He's a saint. He's the greatest person on the planet. How much does fame mean to you? How much does your success mean to my you? My success means a great deal to me, and my stage presence and being on stage means a great deal to me. My music is first in my life. And what's second? What do you sacrifice for your music? For I anything? don't sacrifice anything for my music. But secondly, I would love to be married, you know. I think I'll marry the cameraman over there. <laughs> but I would love to be married. I have a man of my own, but that's second to my music. My music, nothing takes its place. Nothing. You've been married before. Have you been, un been unlucky? Twice. Unlucky at love? Yeah, un 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 unlucky at marriages. Not so unlucky at love. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of love, few marriages. Yes, two marriages. Why didn't they work out? 
Uh, the music got in the way, and uh, in the, in the, in the one where I married the cop from the United States, the music got in the way, and he treated me like a horse. You know, a nonstop walk, workaholic horse. And the one in Tunisia, well, that was very hot like a, like a volcano. Uh, and his family didn't want him to move to France, and France didn't want him because he's a North, Amer North African. And the volcano didn't last. No, but it lasted long enough for me never to forget it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Among all the unforgettable things and unforgettable people in your life, there was Martin Luther King, wasn't there? Oh, yes. Well, I marched with him. I knew him. I composed a song for him. I knew his wife, all his children. And I was in the Selma march with him and the march on Alabama at Miles College in Alabama, and the march on Washington. I was right beside his side. We saw the public face of him. We saw the public man. What was he like in those private moments when he was out of the public eye? Darling, he was always on stage. His, his dedication was of such immense proportion that he never forgot for a minute that he was there to lead my people. He never forgot that for a minute. And uh, when he was not on stage, he was still on stage. He was always talking about equal rights. You've said in the past that you would have worked to try to get him to the presidency. Do you think realistically that he could ever have had a shot at yes, the presidency? Yes, he could have. Yes, he could have, baby. He could have. If, we'd, if we hadn't gotten killed, and we'd had a little bit more support. You really think that America was ready for a black president? Yes, I do. Because even black politicians in Washington these days say they don't think that's the case. We well, talk not now. Jesse Jackson was no match for him. There's not been a man since then. And his dream came true with Nelson Mandela because Nelson got it done in South Africa, in South Africa. So the same thing that was done in South Africa could have, could have been, been done. done in the United States. Yes, I distinctly believe that. I need a cigarette. You're making me hot. <laughs> Can I have a light, uh, um, please? Go ahead. How did you feel when he died? Oh, Martin God, Luther man, King. I was devastated. I wrote a song in his honor the next day called The King of Love is Dead. How much did that devastate you? I mean, what did it do oh, to I, you? Oh, I life? think I must have cried for two weeks. And it killed my inspiration for the civil rights movement. I'm ready. In the United States, and I moved away. You were also scared, weren't you, because of all the killing that was going on, because yes, I was Jack scared. Kennedy was killed, Robert Kennedy was killed. Did you think they were coming after you? Uh, not only that, the, the FBI was after me. They had a file on you, didn't mm -hmm. they? In Washington. You never saw it, did you? Uh, no, we were told about it, and it's in my book. I put, wrote a book called I Put a Spell on You. And in there, and I did a film called Nina Simone La Legend, and it's in there that the FBI has a file on me. And they, indeed, they went to Curtis Institute of Music, where I was rejected as a, a, for a scholarship, and asked Ms. Vladimir Sokolov if I had ever been uh, mixed up in the rebellion. And he said they never found anything, but they actually went to Curtis Institute and, in, and, 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 and uh, inquire about me. Dr. Simone, you were born in North Carolina. Yes, I was. In North Carolina. Very poor, your family. Very poor. Born. Yes, very poor. Was there not a lot to of eat? love? A lot of love, but not, lot much, of love. not much to eat? Uh, at times, my mother had a saying 
she said, well, we don't know what we're going to get dinner tonight, but I'll pray and it'll come. And sure enough, she prayed and it came. She's been a uh, minister for 57 years. She's now 97 years old. And you first sang in her church, didn't mm -hmm. you? What was that like? Oh, it was, it was fun because I had never studied the piano. I was a child prodigy. So when they got up and started shouting, I started playing. <laughs> Literally sat down and started playing. Started playing. The, the first piano. song I played was God Be With You Till We Meet Again. I played that at three years old. And then you went on to train as a, a classical pianist. Yes. That was your love, wasn't it, really? Yes. Classical I'm not piano. over it. I'm not over it yet. Are you, are you disappointed that you didn't, in the end, become what you and your parents yes, wanted to be, which yes. was the first black concert pianist? Yes, because States, we don't we? have any. All we have is Andre Watts, and they don't accept him very much because he's part German. The blacks don't accept him, but they would have accepted me. At the age of 12, you were playing in a library, weren't you? In a music library. Yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was my first recital. And something happened. Some, somebody said something to your parents, didn't they? Yeah, they, they put they them say? in the back of the, of the room to watch me, and I got up bravely. I was only 12, and I said, if my parents don't sit in the front seat, I don't play. And they were put there because they were That's black. That's right. How did that make you feel? It was my first encounter with racism. My favorite record that I listen to now is Marian Anderson, who is the first, the world's first black contralto. I listen to her every morning. She wakes me up and gives me inspiration to start the day. She sings a song. Oh, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, and he will give you your heart's desire, and he will give you your heart's desire. Religion is deeply ingrained in you. Deeply ingrained. All religions? You, All you, religions. You've got I don't a lot believe, of religion. I don't interest believe, in religion. I don't religion. believe in any one uh, religion. No, I don't believe in any one religion. I believe in Allah. I believe in the Hindu religion because I studied yoga for 21 years. I believe in Buddhism. I believe in all of them because they're necessary for the sheep, darling. The sheep have to have something to follow, and religion is necessary. I believe in all of them. So when you got turned down by the Curtis, school in Philadelphia. You needed to make some money, didn't you? Yes, I so did, to help my parents. So you started playing in bars and supper parties? And yes, and I did. What was that like? It was awful. But it got you some money? Got me $90 a week, 50 of which I gave my parents. And they came to Philadelphia to be close to you? Yes, they did. What was your big break? My big break was going to Atlantic City uh, and playing in a supper club and singing the song Porgy, which was given to me by a uh, fan, a, uh, a student there, and uh, he liked Billie Holiday. I can't stand her, but he liked her, and uh, he asked me if I would sing it. So since I didn't have to practice the piano while I was cleaning up my room in Atlantic City to, to work every night from 9 to 4, I learned the song and first sang it there in a bar. And an agent heard me and took me to New York and put it on a record. And then in 1957 came Carnegie Hall. That's right. Huge success, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But something disappointed you because you wrote a letter to your parents, didn't you? I don't remember that now. You apparently wrote a letter to your parents saying, this is where you wanted me to play, but I should have been playing, playing Bach. Bach. Yes, your I did. Your favorite composer. I did. I did. I did do that. So this was your glory occasion, but you were still disappointed? Well, I love the audience. But I wasn't playing classical music, 
and I wanted to be. And so I wrote, and I quote again what you have just said, I wrote, yes, I'm in Carnegie Hall finally, but I'm not playing Bach. And then came My Baby Just Cares For Me. Oh, well, now that's years later. Years later, but it was huge, wasn't it? Yes, it was it huge. It started out as a song for an ad, wasn't it? No, it started mm -hmm. out as a, as a, a, a piece of Play-Doh for children uh, in England. It started out as a video for children. And then it uh, um, got bigger and bigger, and everybody started to hear it. And it became very famous. And it's the most famous song I have recorded. People say it turned you from cult into legend. Yeah, I think, think so. You think that's right? Yeah, I think so. So you knew after that you were on your way? Yeah, I was on my way before that because, let's face it, I've been playing, I was playing around the world before then. I heard about it in Switzerland. When you left America in 1972, you left because you couldn't Racism. stand Racism. Just that. Racism. You couldn't stand it any longer. I couldn't stand it. Walking still down can't the street, stand it. Crossing the street, <coughs> you get racism crossing the street. You get it in every. It's in the very fabric of American society. You can't stand to go to America. No, I can't. I went this year for the first time, right? Two times, and I, I worked at, at Newark new stadium and Seattle and they were so happy and surprised to see me because they hadn't seen me in how many years Clifton seven. in seven years but you didn't feel well treated this time yes this time they were more than happy to see me they hadn't seen me so long they thought I was dead <laughs> but you wouldn't go back and live there no way and you keep telling them that. No way am I going to ever go back there and live. And I'm not the only one. Josephine Baker went back twice. And uh, she, after her second time, she never went back. So you traveled to Liberia, didn't you? Oh, yes. And that was apparently the happiest time in your life. It was. Why? I was at home. And you remember that uh, Liberia had a liaison with America. So it was known as a place for blacks whom they could not contain. And they were all rich. I lived on the beach. I had house servants. The, um, and the uh, president's daughter gave me a house on the beach. I stayed on the beach every damn day. It was fantastic. I was happier there. And, and what's more, I got in. Uh, um, I got engaged to the foreign minister's father, who was at that time 70 years old. But he was killed, wasn't he? Yes, he was killed. They killed 13 of them. In a coup. In, in a coup. Life seems to have gone wrong for you after no, that. No, I wouldn't say that. My music has always lifted me, and I've had a few love affairs that have lifted me. Life hasn't gone wrong for me. I've been unlucky. Uh, no, I haven't been. I, no, I have no complaints about my life. But in 1978 in England, you told a newspaper, my personal life is a shambles. I'm black and I've been struggling for half my life. Well, that's true. My personal life was a shambles and it still is. I don't have uh, a lover. Uh, I have a friend but not a lover. My personal life uh, has been a shambles because it's, everything has had to be sacrificed for the music. But then there were reports in the late 70s of a drug overdose and... No, no, no. You're Wait, running no. out of money and I ran being out of money. And... I wasn't homeless. I've never been homeless. That's a lie. You also seem to have had a lot of problems with the music industry. Yes, Racketeers, you've talked oh, about. For God's sakes, they don't pay you. I still have 60 albums uh, being pirated 
in um, England right now. Nobody's actually paying you for this? No. My, I have a great lawyer from San Francisco, and he goes after as many pirates as he can, but he can't catch them all. They run the streets too fast. I've been pirated all over the world. When you get up on a stage now, and, and they said this in, in 1987 when you were at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club oh, in yes. London. They said you get the whole Nina Simone when she comes up on the stage. You get her mood, you get her monologue, you get the music. Is this the whole Nina Simone experience when that's you get true. up on a stage? That's right. And you keep them waiting until you're ready. Uh, that's right. All the time. Why? Why? Because I have to be composed. I have to be poised. I have to remember what my first piano teacher taught me. You do not touch that piano until you are ready and until they are ready to listen to you. You just make them wait. How do you judge that moment? Oh, I judge it from my, from my head and from my uh, instincts. And then when it's ready, then when you're happy and the, the crowd is happy? Is when they're ready, I play for them. Is it always a buzz? Is it always a huge kick for you? Yes, it's always a huge kick. To get better with the years? Yes, it does. In what way? You're here. <laughs> <laughs> In what way? Do you still enjoy it as much? Oh, yes, I enjoy it as much. You happy to keep traveling as much as you do? I mean, you're on the road constantly. Never get tired? Yes, I get very tired. I stay tired. But I don't mind being on the road for my music. Before I let you go, one question. There is a report that at a business meeting once, you pulled out a knife. I sure damn did. Did you? Yes, I did. Why? Because Oh, dear. Because there was a record company. <laughs> You were about to say something you I shouldn't. can't say. I was a record company that stole my albums and didn't pay me, and they came to Switzerland, and I said, where's my money? They said, we're not going to give you any money. I said, oh, yes, you are. And I got a gun. Uh, it was a gun. It wasn't a knife. And I followed him to a restaurant, and I tried to kill him. I missed him, and I went back to America. You actually pulled the trigger? Oh, f not. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and, felt, and felt better for it. Oh, yes. Sorry I didn't get him. So now we've advertised that side of your life, and you say that you're still looking for a lover. Um, people, are, Men are going to be a bit nervous of you, aren't they? They are very. Do you manage to put them at ease? No. And you don't try too hard? No, I no, I don't try. I tr yes, I try hard, but I refuse to cook or to clean. So they've got to take you as, they, as you they've are? They've got to take me as I am and recognize that I'm a star as well as a woman, and they have to deal with the two. And treat you properly? Uh, definitely. Nina Simone, Dr. Simone, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program. Can I say one more thing? I'm Please a doctor. Sure. Do you know why? You're a doctor of humanities? Yes. From the Malcolm X University in Chicago? Yeah. And a doctor of music? From Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. Thank you for setting the record straight. It's been a great pleasure.